Hello, my friends. Thank you so much for watching our live stream tonight from Arbor Christian Fellowship. And for those of you that are newbies, I'm Danny Daniels, the pastor of Arbor Christian Fellowship, formerly El Toro Road Baptist Church on El Toro Road in South Orange County. And so uh, tonight we're going to do a, a study that I hope is very, very encouraging. There's so much bad news around and so many things going on and not knowing what's what about that even the very air we breathe and everything else and all the political nonsense uh, going on and uh, people just in some anxiety. I wanted to take a couple of things that Jesus said that will lift us up and we need just that encouragement. So focusing in on the Gospel of John in the New Testament, the Gospel of John in the New Testament, I want us to, to, to look at uh, three great promises from John's Gospel. And if you've gotten your exercise from running around in evangelical circles, uh, some of this will be very familiar. Uh, John 3.16 will be and should be very familiar because most of you, that was your very first Bible memory verse you ever memorized, whether you went to vacation Bible school or later on in a church youth group or church life. So we're going to take a look uh, tonight at three great promises from John's Gospel. And if you're, you're watching anywhere in the world, especially USA and especially up and down the state of California, so are you my high school friends and other friends and, uh, and things, just note that you're watching. That always is encouraging and always uh, lifts us up. And so it matters. You're, you're just saying, yeah, we're viewing, we're watching. Uh, it really matters. And I know some of you watching from my old high school, I know you're still in shock that I'm a pastor and <laughs> have been all these years and things. And so uh, I'm so glad to have you uh, uh, and, you know, when we have our next big reunion, I'm going to try to make it up there and things. Uh, so the last I saw most of you was at our 25-year reunion. I didn't make it to the 50-year reunion a couple of years ago, but uh, we'll see what happens. But we can have a reunion here on Facebook, live streaming of the Bible study on Wednesday night or midweek service at Arbor Christian Fellowship. So three great promises from the Bible. By the way, there are... 7,132 promises in the Bible. That's one out of every seven verses contains some kind of promise that God has made. Now, God never breaks a promise. God never breaks a promise. We humans tend to break a few promises here and there. I remember, you know, telling my father, uh, you know, when I was a teenager, and preteen, I'd always say, but, but Dad, you said... You said, <laughs> and then same thing with my son to me, but, but Dad, you said, I go, I did? <laughs> you know, but God keeps his word. 7,132 promises. And so I want us to claim about three or four uh, tonight. We're going to take a look. Three great promises from John's gospel. First one is John 3.16. That should ring a bell. Perhaps at home on your kitchen table or living room, you've got a notepad or a pencil pen and a scratch pad to jot some of these down. Uh, you could later on look at them for your own personal Bible study time and enhance uh, the study. And uh, my goal with the study tonight is that it would be a springboard that you could jump off of and dive deep, deep dive God's truth in these three passages. So as I said, first one's John 3.16. Second, John 11. 25, 26. John 11, 25, 26. And then the third one, uh, all in John's Gospel, is John 14, 1 through 3. John 14, 1 through 3. So let's take a look at these one by one. I'm going to just give some application and some ways of understanding these and how to look at them and how to apply them into our life, and I'm praying that as this is Wednesday, that for the rest of this week, that uh, these will be very, very, very strong. So the, the first one. Now, before we look at that, I just want to just quickly jump into John's Gospel, the Gospel of John. In the New Testament, it begins with four books at the very front, at the beginning, called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and Eckhart played Jimmy Doolittle in the movie Midway, and of course the most famous of all, 30 seconds over Tokyo. Those of you 
40 and under, 50 and under, I not even know who and what I'm talking about, but 30 seconds, 30 seconds over Tokyo, starring Spencer Tracy as Jimmy Doolittle. And so, typical biography talks about his birth, his family, his background, his teen years, school years, college if he went, adult years, and things. The Gospels of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not your typical normal biographies. In fact, it's almost a misnomer to call it a biography because uh, it's more a gospel, a book of the good news. For instance, John's gospel only covers at the most 20 days of the three-year public ministry of Jesus Christ. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. John is the highest, uh, it's up there, gospel. Matthew presents Christ as perfect king. King of the Jews, the genealogy goes back to Abraham and David. Abraham, the first Jew, so to speak. David, the first legitimate, real king of the Jews. And Jesus is the king of kings, lord of lords. And he was actually, in his day, in line, physically by birth, uh, to be the legitimate uh, king. But the kingdom had broken up. And uh, But Matthew presents Christ as perfect king. Mark presents him as perfect servant as a perfect servant. It's a power gospel of him doing power miracles, especially over the satanic and demonic. And by the way, Mark has no gospel because nobody cares about the background of a servant. Uh, you see, Matthew presents Christ's royalty and his line for the kingdom and kingship. Matthew, nobody cares about the background of, uh, of a servant or a slave. What matters is power to do the job right then and there. The next gospel is Luke. It presents Jesus Christ as perfect man. And it covers a lot of his uh, physical, uh, human emotions. Uh, and also it covers a lot of uh, uh, the Son of Man uh, stories about him. The genealogy does not go back just to Abraham and David. It goes all the way back to Adam as, as perfect man. And by the way, something interesting... Matthew was written to the Jewish mindset, because Jesus, king of the Jews. Mark was written to the Roman mindset. The Romans were into power and getting stuff done, and so Jesus, as perfect servant and having power, you know, the Romans were on a power trip. And then, uh, check this out, the book of Luke was written by a Greek to the Greek mind. Philosophical, you know, uh, and so Jesus is presented as the perfect man. John, and these three Gospels, Bible teachers and Bible scholars and theologians call them the synoptic Gospels because in a way all three are the same with different shades of emphasis, like I said. So they're called the synoptic, S-Y-N, the same, similar, optic, to see, view. The three have the same view, the same uh, systematic outline, almost, so to speak, and they're similar and then the fourth gospel is the book of John, and the book of John is not one of the synoptic gospels. It is totally different. It is out there. It is a, a book that presents Jesus Christ as perfect God. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I, I can't emphasize this enough. I know I've said this a lot on, on Wednesday nights, and I'm not mindlessly repeating myself. I'm trying to be didactic to teach. So when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you have that basic foundational springboard understanding you could dive into it and deep dive its truths john's gospel presents jesus christ as perfect god as perfect god there's no genealogy because the book begins not with abraham not with luke not with the first miracles of jesus as in mark it goes all the way back to eternity past john 1 1 says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We call that the incarnation, God becoming man. And John's gospel has a pace and a rhythm that is different. Like I said, it only covers maybe 15 to 20 days of the three-year public ministry of Christ. And in John's gospel, the glory of Jesus Christ is emphasized. The Word became flesh, John 1, 14, and we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only one begotten of, of God the Father. He came into this world. It was called the incarnation. 
And, you know, chili con carne is chili with meat. Carne means meat in its Latin background. So the Latin theologians, the Latin church fathers uh, coined the term incarnation. God became flesh. And the Gospel of John is an incarnational Christology. By Christology, I mean the study of the life and being and person and essence of Jesus Christ. It's incarnational. God became flesh and dwelt among us. One thing that is very particular and unique to the Gospel of John is that I call it the glory theology. It's a glory theology. It's a theology of the glory of Jesus Christ, His glory. Another uniqueness about John's Gospel is its structure. Now, any building must have a solid foundation and structure, you know, unless, if it doesn't, it becomes a house of cards that falls over. Have you ever played with the deck of cards where you, you know, you build a little edifice and you add on to it, and maybe you could get it up to three, four stories before it tumbles over? Well, the higher you go, the deeper the foundation, the more solid the foundation has to be. And it's interesting, John's Gospel has a unique structure and pattern of sevens. Mark that down. Write the number seven down somewhere. Sevens. And I'm not going to take a lot of time on this, but I'm going to give you a quick crash course called Bible Numerology 101. Numbers in the Bible have meaning. Why does the number 40 keep appearing over and over again? Well, let me give you the numbers. One is the number of God. God is one. God is one, there's no other. Two is the number of witness. Two is the number of witnesses. That's why in the Jewish courts, they needed to have two witnesses. And even in today, modern court, our modern courts, in accordance with Blackstone's law, which was based a lot on Judeo-Christian foundation and much of the Old Testament law, it takes two witnesses to convict anybody. If there's one witness, that one witness could lie. But if there's the testimony of two witnesses, that's enough. And that's why it's interesting that Jesus sent them out, sent the, sent the disciples out how? Two by two. That's why in the book of Revelation, at the end time, it talks about the two witnesses, probably the return of Elijah and, and Moses, uh, two people in the Old Testament that never formally died. I mean, check that out. That's a complete different study. Two witnesses. Three is a divine number of the Trinity. Three in one. One in three. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Four is the number of creation, but specifically the number of earth. And our earthly realm, the earth was created on the, on the fourth day. Seven is a number of perfection and completion, and a number that captures God's working. That's why three, the number of the Trinity and of God, and four, the number of earth, three plus four equals seven. It's God's work upon this earth. Three times four is the number twelve. Twelve is God using human agency in the world. The twelve tribes, the twelve fathers in the Old Testament. Oh, the twelve apostles. Twelve, twelve. Seven is the perfect number. Now, six is a number that falls short of seven. Six is the evil number, the incomplete number. That's why the Antichrist number is six, six, six. Six, 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 the, the evil uh, trinity, the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. So seven is the ideal perfect number. What am I getting at with all what I've been saying is this. John's gospel is outlined and structured in a foundation of sevens. Of sevens, seven I am sayings of Jesus Christ about his person. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, I am. Seven, seven I ams. Now Matthew, Mark, and Luke record up to about 33 miracles, 31 to 33 miracles that Jesus did. John's Gospel only records seven. Only records seven. There's that number seven again as the outlying structure of completion and perfection in the Gospel that presents Jesus Christ as perfect God. And they're not even called miracles. Uh, in the original Greek language, the word miracle does not appear, but the word simeon appears, which means sign. 
sign miracles to show a sign, to teach a lesson to us. Seven sign miracles. Jesus changing the water to one. Jesus multiplying the bread. Jesus, uh, of a culminative. By the way, each of the miracles in, uh, in John's Gospel, each of the seven got harder and harder and harder accumulating with the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead after he was dead four days and decomposed. Remember the sisters when Jesus said, open up the tomb. What did the sisters say? But Lord, he stinketh by now. And that wasn't the first or the last sister to say that her brother stunk. And I know because I got two sisters. So oh, not, not even go there. Seven I am, seven sign miracles. And John's Gospel outlines seven significant days and then uh, seven witnesses and seven divisions. It, it, the book has a big framework of seven. So I want to go into the three promises now. First one is John 3.16. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now, Write down 12-1-12. 12, 1-12. 12, 1, 12. In the King James Bible, John 3.16, in the English, has 25 words. 25 words. You remember on TV back in the olden days, some of you that are a little older or up there in your years, or, uh, you know, Social Security qualified or Medicare qualified or, or even close up to that age area? Uh, there used to be contests where you would, in 25 words or less, write something and then you'd win a prize if you won. John 3.16 in the King James has 25 words. And you can divide it by 12, 1, 12. The first 12 words, one dead center middle word, one word, the word son. And then the last 12 words, the first 12 words say everything about God that we need to know. Everything about God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. The last 12 words say everything about you and I that matters for us. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And dead center, you know, 12 and 12 is 24. But John 3.16 has 25 words in the King James Version. In the middle is, is, is just one word, son. Jesus Christ in the dead center of everything, the dead center. Jesus is the center. Everything revolves around Christ. God's love, our need. God in us. Christ is in the middle. Christ is in the center, just as he was in the middle cross on Calvary. Everything centers around Jesus Christ. Christ is central. Today, it is 2021. Why? Because 2,021 years ago, something happened. God came into this world. God invaded the world. God invested in the world. And God involved himself in the world through the person of Jesus Christ. The first Christmas, God became flesh and dwelt among us. That happened 2,021 years ago. Even the atheist who says there is no God, when he writes a check or writes a letter or writes out the date 2021, he or she is giving testimony to the centrality of Jesus Christ in the center of all things. I challenge you, is Jesus Christ the center of your life? Is Jesus Christ the center of your heart? Is Jesus Christ the center of your home? Christian, church member, pastor, viewing, is Jesus Christ the center of your church? So that's, 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 that's John 3.16. That's the first passage. The next one. It's found in John 11, John 11, 25, 26. So flip over a few pages, John 11, 25, uh, 26. This is at a funeral. This is at a funeral. The funeral of his friend Lazarus and the weeping Mary and Martha, his two sisters. By the way, Jesus busted up every funeral he ever went to, three of them, by raising the dead person to life. He raised the young boy. He raised an older person. Here he raises Lazarus from the dead. And uh, John 11, 25, 26 is another great promise. Here Jesus said, uh, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now he's talking about not only just physical life, but eternal life. 
spiritual life and physical death on earth for the believer, for the Christian, is a transition. Of course, none of us want to die. We want to live as long as we can. We don't want our loved ones to, to, to die, even though we know the assurance that we'll see him in heaven if we're believers in Christ. But here Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, that uh, we live in him. And the blessing here is that we have the satisfaction of the living Christ, living his life in us and through us and out of us. John 3.16 talks about our salvation. John 3.16 talks about our salvation. John 11.25-26 talks about our satisfaction. Our satisfaction in him. Because he lives, he is alive in us. And here, in contrast to John 3.16... Uh, he begins John 3.16 with God, God the Father, for God. So here he begins in verse 25 in John chapter 11, verse 25, 26. He begins it with I am. I am. It's the word in Greek, ego, eni. And in Aramaic, it's the word haya, which was a name, a formal name for God. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, when Jesus said, I am the door of life, he's saying God is the bread of life. God is the door. And he's saying, I am that. I, I am it. I, I am that. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about spiritual life. When we are born again, when we accept Jesus Christ, we are guaranteed eternal life after we die in heaven. But we have eternal life, not when we die and go to heaven, we have eternal life the minute we accept Jesus Christ. If you've said yes to Christ and have accepted him, you now have eternal life and the satisfaction that could come with it. The last promise, the last promise, and boy, in these days and times, with just the way things are in the news and some of the stress and anxiety and people are facing and just unsure about jobs and unsure... Uh, we have people in our church that have been laid off and have lost jobs and things, and uh, we're trying to do the best to uh, help and minister and pray. But the third, the third passage of Scripture is John 14, 1 through 3. John 14, 1, 2, and 3. Uh, this, Jesus said, in the upper room after they had the Lord's Supper together, or what is commonly called the Passover supper the passover dinner and this is hours before jesus gets arrested and then nailed to the cross uh, this is called uh by some jesus's farewell discourse to his disciples actually private judas had already cut out to betray jesus and he's left with the 11 you know peter james and john philip thomas that crew others call this and i prefer to call it the upper room they were there in that upper room. Possibly it belonged to John the disciple's mother or family. Uh, he was pretty well-to-do compared to the other uh, blue-collar uh, disciples. Seven of them were shepherds. Others were in different kind of business. They worked with their hands, and they weren't part of the Jewish intel intelligentsia, uh, so to speak, common, ordinary people. And that's the one thing that's so beautiful about God. God uses common, ordinary, ordinary people like like you and I. But here in the upper room, the first three verses, uh, the disciples knew something was up, something strange was going on, something weird was going to happen. Jesus, they they just knew, they had that sense, and of course Jesus would be arrested, then crucified. They didn't have the understanding and full picture that they had after the day of Pentecost, of course. But neither of us got the full picture and the full thing when we first started reading scripture or went to VBS or went to church youth group or attended church. Even when we first got saved and baptized in believer's baptism, we had an idea, but we didn't have the full scope. Now, here, we, we have a full understanding and, and a full scope of, uh, of, of God's truth. So here, Jesus is telling his inner circle, he, he is speaking intimate, heart to heart. He's not thundering and proclaiming and preaching to a crowd or to a group or teaching in the synagogue. He is in the upper room 
intimately speaking, intimately speaking to his own, his intimate followers. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And this is the beginning of the upper room discourse. I'm working on a sermon series up until Easter Sunday on John 14, 15, and 16. Now we're studying parts of that in our adult Sunday school. Next week's, or this Sunday's adult Sunday school, is, is a couple of verses from John chapter 14. But uh, we're going to be looking at John chapter 14, 15, 16, then Jesus going to the cross, and then Jesus resurrecting on, on the first Easter Sunday. Or Resurrection Sunday is a better term, Resurrection Sunday. But I'm doing a sermon series and working on it diligently called from an upper room to the empty tomb. From an upper, and that's the last 20, 30 hours of the life of Christ, and then 72 hours until his resurrection. From an upper room to the empty tomb with the cross in between. And it begins in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus says, and if you have a red letter edition Bible, I, I always prefer red letter edition Bibles, where the actual words Jesus said are in red. For a dummy and a lightweight like me, it makes it easier. It, it makes it easier. So I can see the actual words of, of Jesus Christ. John 14, 1 through 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, in the King James, many dwelling places. Uh, if it were not so, I would have told you. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. In other words, so we can understand it, Jesus says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And where I am in heaven, you're going to be there with me. But here's the formal verse. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Four times in this uh, 14th chapter of the book of John, Jesus says that uh, he promises to come again. He promises to, to return. And so just a couple of wrap-ups that I want us to see here before our time runs out in these three great promises. By the way, this is only three promises uh, from the 7,132 promises in its entirety in the Bible. Just three of them. The ones in John are just so spectacular. I challenge you to make a lifetime habit of studying the Gospel of John. It's pretty simple. It's pretty basic. It's pretty concrete. When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, do you have to have a ton of theology and education to understand that? No. What is bread? Something we eat for nourishment, for sustenance. When Jesus said, I am the door in John 10, 9, do we have to have a big highfalutin theology to understand that? No. What does a door do? A door opens the way to an entryway. Oh, something else. A door can keep you out, too. Those that reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are kept out of heaven by their own choice. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come unto repentance, unto, unto Christ. So John's gospel is a relatively simple gospel with concrete issues, a lot of words and talk from Jesus here, and it's a very relational, very relational book that presents Jesus Christ as perfect God. So John 3.16 presents salvation. John 11, 25, 26 gives us satisfaction. John 3.16, salvation in Christ. John 11, 25, 26, our satisfaction in Christ. And John 14, 3, our sanctification, our total, full sanctification in Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a three-point outline of our salvation. It's called justification, sanctification, and glorification. All those Asians. Okay? Justification is when we're saved. Salvation, we're justified. We're justified through the blood of Jesus Christ. And when God sees us, it's just as if I never ever sinned. We're justified. Justification. Then comes sanctification. Sanctus means to be set apart. Sanctification means that we're set apart from the world. We become more and more Christ-like. And we grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is not talking about perfection. That doesn't come yet. This just talks about becoming and striving more and more towards being like Christ. So if you've been saved, you're, you're justified. If you're saved and you're, you're walking in this earth, you are being sanctified. 
And it doesn't come automatic. That you pray over, that you study in the Word of God, that you learn to walk like Christ, live like Christ. You learn of Christ. Jesus said, learn of me. Follow me and learn of me. John, uh, Matthew 11. Uh, there. And then the third thing, justified, sanctified, and then glorified. Glorified. That's when we go to heaven. As he is, so are we. Wow. We become perfect. And uh, sin does not have reign, nor presence. See, when we're saved, we're saved so that the penalty of sin is removed. As we're being sanctified, the power of sin is being removed in our life. It's a process. It takes time. But then when we go to heaven, we're glorified. Then the presence of sin is removed. The presence, the penalty, and the power of sin is removed. We see in John 3.16, it's an endless, endless life. It's more than endless existence. It's a new quality of life. And in John's Gospel, when it says in John 3.16, that whosoever believes in me shall have everlasting life. Everlasting life doesn't, in the totality, mean long distance of life. It means quality of life. Can I convey to you the difference between quantity and quality? Quantity is amount, but quality is just a, a quality of amount, something great and something wonderful. We have endless life. Another thing about John 3, 16, and especially in John 11, 25, 26, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life, uh, he not only has eternal life within himself, but he shares he shares that divine life with us. God loved us and God gave. God gave. So John 3, 16, we see his love toward us. In John 11, 25, 26, I am the resurrection and the life. We see his aliveness in us. And then in John 14, 1 through 3, where I am preparing a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. It is his togetherness with us. So his love toward us, John 3.16. His aliveness in us, John 11, 25, 26, I am the resurrection and the life. And then his togetherness with us. Uh, he begins uh, this chapter and ends this chapter with the terms, let not your heart be troubled, believe in me. It begins with believing in him, it ends with believing in him. In fact, the whole upper room discourse, beginning in John chapter 16 and ending in John chapter, uh, beginning in chapter 14 and 16, both end with believe, 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 believe appears over and over again. To believe means to just trust, take him at his word. Trust him. It's not an emotional feeling. It's not a quiver in the liver, but it is going all in. I'm sure some of you watched uh Back in the day when the Texas Hold'em poker craze was on TV, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and it seemed like you couldn't channel surf without seeing Texas Hold'em poker on, on TV. It was, it was a big thing. And one of the things in that is you go all in, you put all your chips in, betting that your hands, you know, your full house is going to beat your opponents straight. Uh, for Jesus Christ, we go all in. We, because Jesus went all in for us at the cross. He went all in for us at the cross. And we go all in for him. We see his aliveness in us, his togetherness with us. And I want to I want to close uh, with one thought that I kind of think it's kind of kind of cool. Uh, God showed this to me. Whether you rent uh or don't, uh, I just want you to know, that, do you know that you've got real estate? And you're a real estate mogul in the kingdom of God? Let me repeat John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are King James' many mansions. Modern English languages say uh, dwelling places or many rooms to capture the intimacy of our being with God in heaven and the fellowship that we have. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many dwelling places, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. 
I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, where I am, there you may be also. You have real estate. You're a spiritual real estate mogul in heaven. You, you own real estate in heaven, uh, and it was paid for. Uh, not on an 80-20 plan, you know, 20% down payment, 80% financed, uh, you know, the interest rate. Guess what? It was paid in full, paid in total. When Jesus went all in at the cross, it was paid in the blood of Jesus Christ. It is yours. You have the deed. John 14, 1 through 3 is the deed to your real estate in heaven. And the beauty for me in this real estate in heaven, this, this promise, this preparation, this, this provision, and this presence of, of God is that, that we have the deed, real estate in heaven. And the beauty is not that we have property there, but we have a person, a person that is there. And we will know one another as, as we are in heaven, in our real estate that, that we have in heaven. So I, I, just, I just wanted to say, in this time of bad news and anxiety and craziness over this virus and uh, this craziness in our politics and uncertainty uh, at the time of so-called two presidents and what's happening, a, some bogus Congress and do-nothing Congress, I'm thankful that we don't have a do-nothing God. He did something about our sin. He did something about my sin. Not only did he do something, he sent and went all in with the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. So you and I have a deed signed in the blood of Jesus Christ, eternal quality of life and that real estate. So starting now, I want you to start thinking like a real estate mogul. That you've got real estate waiting for you in heaven, and someday we'll all be partying, partying up there because God made some promises. The promise of salvation in John 3.16. The promise of satisfaction. Satisfaction in John 11.25.26. And the promise of full, completed sanctification of our life in John 14. One through three. Let me go ahead and pray. Father, we come and I pray that you speak to our hearts. We thank you for this promise, this preparation, the provision you've given us. We thank you for the promise of your presence. We thank you that you can help us with our troubled hearts, that you can calm us in time of, of trouble. And we know, Jesus, that uh, you were troubled in spirit in chapter 13 because of sin, and because knowing that you would be separated from God the Father for a while because of my sin and our sin. We thank you for these great and mighty promises. I thank you that you are the center of John 3.16. I thank you for your love toward us, your aliveness in us, and your togetherness with us. For I pray in Jesus' name, amen.